Tell me if you tell me if you guys want to uh, take back your consent of live stream. In a world where we are already at the mercy of, in some in some democracies, we are already at the mercy of the eligibility of certain companies. It's essential that we form. It's essential that we keep the institution of democracy that uh, that provides a check to the excesses of these companies. So we, I would argue, this debate into. Especially, I'll talk about the idea or the basis behind Western liberal democracy and how principally it's against Western liberal uh, the principles of Western liberal democracy to do this. And secondly, I will talk about, like, for example, the problems we have with companies now and how it, how it's made worse when you mechanize labor. So, like, but, but first, we first need to understand that uh, this mechanization of labor is not about industries that has already been mechanized. No, not, not, not about industries like you know factories and things like that. It's about industries that have not been mechanized and will be mechanized. Meaning industries like service industries or transportation yeah, yeah. industries. Meaning, for example, service industries so at, like the airport in Singapore, where you have an entire airport that has no human beings in it, and where you can automate the system from start to the end. And transportation in terms of the long haul drivers. If you have like automated cars or automated uh, trucks, you can literally uh, do this. So what does this mean? It means that there will be a huge job loss because a lot because this is the Industrial Revolution 4.0. So a lot of jobs will be lost, and that is something that must be defended by side opening uh, by side uh, by side opposition. Right? Yes. So hypothetically, if you lose thousand jobs but increases human quality of life and 
the master is stuck as a whole, will you reject it? Okay, so I'll deal with that. I'll deal with that thing in my arguments later. So, um, uh, secondly, is also the idea of like what, like what is Western liberal democracy? We believe that Western liberal, liberal democracy is uh, based around the principles of like giving choice, about giving the best amount of choice or maximizing choice for its citizens, or giving each citizen the, ha having a level of equal say in terms of how the country is being led and having the electorate as an important check and balance to what happens within the country. So, first argument, which is how it affects the maximization of choice. So we'll deal with what you, you're going to say. Because the alternative that the, the opposition is probably going to break here is that, okay, we're going to reduce the number of jobs, therefore we're going to tax these companies, and these companies will give a universal basic income where people will be, uh, where people will just get money and like do whatever they want with life. Now, notice that there are several problems with this. In the context of Western liberal democracies, where you can vote for your stuff and you know lobby and you can like um, change policies you are not dependent on the government to be, uh, on the on the government to give you the amount of money that you deserve meaning that you as a as, as someone that you, you you don't have actual labor that you can show for yourself you have to depend on the government it means that you for example you have more to the government or you have to be uh, uh, you have to like for example sacrifice certain principles if you want to affect the, gov the government this looks like for example if you're like you know you're, if you're someone from california and the government in power is someone from the republicans you'll be more likely to be oh because i get I, I i depend myself on like universal basic income therefore i'll be more likely to be uh, 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 approachable to them. And secondly, it also depends on, like, for example, having these companies pay their equal share of like taxes. Given that they already are like increasing in uh, efficiency and increasing in, in, in profits, what happens then? They will have more money to lobby the government. They will have more money to change policies within the government. Therefore, the, the, the likeliest world in your world is something that is based on hypothetical and you need to show uh, us, us how this universal basic income will definitely be a better choice and will definitely lead to uh, a better world in the future. So let's look at the problems we have with uh, like my second argument, which is the problems we have with companies now and how it's made worse with mechanization of labor. So the problems we have with companies now, number one, they underpay workers like, through a lot of like reasons. For example, they um, they play around labor rules, for example, giving and ensuring that people don't get overtime pay or making sure that they, they, they pay the basic uh, amount or make, make, making sure that they, uh, they, they, they don't get the benefits or uh, playing around this and pressuring governments to loosen uh, labor regulations so that they can take in uh, our workers from outside. So what does this mean? It means that they underpay workers. Secondly, they will probably overwork workers. Even in the best companies around the world, for example, they will overwork workers and pressure them into, for example, even if like, okay, the only way for you to get be successful is for you to like um, compete with your other uh, uh, with other colleagues, and you are therefore there's a pressure for them to overwork themselves to work overtime even without pay and things like that. So how is it made worse when mechanization of labor is widespread, like I've talked before just now? Firstly, workers have lesser leverage in general because now imagine a company like amazon where after the mechanization of labor much of the uh, workforce in like for example the factories or much of the workforce in like uh, in the service industries will have lost their jobs so what does this mean workers in general in the in the in the company in general will have lesser leverage meaning the companies in the uh, meaning the people in the in, in, in the offices on the administrative side will also have lesser leverage secondly these companies will be bigger and obviously will be more efficient and more um, more, more uh, they would be probably be more uh, they have more money and wealth so what does this mean they have lesser of an incentive to placate workers or to ensure that the benefits that they give workers are, are kept because they can just hold this carrot uh, and uh, hold this stick and say, no, sit down, hold this stick and, uh, and tell them, hey, I have this, I can mechanize your labor, so you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have the right to uh, tell me what to do and I can uh, do this to you. So what, how, like, why is this bad in terms of like, modern democracies? Because a lot of like the things that benefit workers in modern liberal democracies is based around the ideas of unions of workers, for example, appealing and, and probably, for example, uh, uh, appealing and um, lobbying for better conditions or better laws and better regulations for workers in general. So if workers have lesser leverage, if, if companies are bigger and are more able to lobby and, and have less of, lesser of an incentive to workers, what happens to these unions? 
these unions will most probably have more of an incentive to placate the companies and also less of an incentive to pressure government to do them because they do not want to lose their jobs. So what, what is the world that we actually prefer on our side? We actually prefer uh, control on this like mechanization of labor. We oppose the mechanization of labor because uh, uh, because at the level that we currently at, in terms of the, for example, in Western liberal democracies, the works that, that are being done like these factories are not to the extent where they can literally, like for example, die or something like that. There is a level of care that is already given to them. But if we mechanize the labor that exists in the country, what happens then is that these liberal democracies will be uh, affected. And for all these reasons, I say side to side opening government. Madam Speakers, the only arguments coming from the opening government is only based on company is equal and there's no bargaining power coming from the labors, right? Under the mechanization of, you know, labors, I'm going to prove to you this is the right point for us to create mechanization of labor in terms of pushing the access towards human side for the labors to begin with. We say two things. Number one, I'm going to try to say to you why under Western liberal democracies, the only way for to uphold the rights of the labors or to create a bargaining power is to create is to create a certain crisis towards the labors in order for them to create a massive choices to give to the government, right? Number one, I'm saying that if they say that the company does not, that is eventually getting more stronger and and the, in the end of the day, the labors would not have the this kind of, of power to speak. We say that is eventually wrong. You need to understand the mechanization of labor is the point where people are eventually trying to create a discussion, right? On how people would eventually be more pressured to, to say that their rights is eventually being taken. We say this is the right time for us to create critics. Number one, Understanding for the past 10 years, mechanization already happens, right? This course has already happened. Under that point, there is the moment where a labor union or international labor organization trying to push more policies to protect the human rights to begin with, right? We say that it's eventually good enough in order to strengthen the protection of labor. But second, we say that we agree that we need to support the right of the labor. How do we do that? Number one, we say that the labor union right now it does not have any kind of bargaining power because the only kind of people that eventually speak out is only those blue collar workers that work Within, uh, with them having their job patterned by the mechanization of labor. Understanding within the future, the kind of mechanization of labor can eventually go to the even the middle economy for people in the, who's working in the office, etc. Right? We say there's more people that should be patterned. We say it's a bigger voices in order for, the, for them to, you know, to speak within the labor union. It is eventually a, a stronger voices towards them to push the government to change something. But second, we understand that it is actually very hard for it is virtually very hard for a company to it is virtually very hard for a company because they have such a big bargaining power, right? We say that it's actually wrong as well. Understanding that the company can only work if the company consumer buy their products, right? It is eventually within the discourse right now that people would eventually go to I would I would only buy certain products coming from company if they are labor friendly and etc. Those kind of discussion is the one that we're gonna uphold in the end of the day. The moment that this thing would eventually becoming the sexy idea for people to talk about, right? Understanding right now there's no threat or there's no point in order for society to push this kind of you know discussion because it is not it is not something that people would like to talk about it is not a threat for the people but second i'm going to try to talk to you why we think that it is eventually not a threat we say that mechanization of labor is eventually is eventually very hard for people right but in order for these western liberal democracies the only way for you to push more incentive in terms of healthcare system or education or etc is only by saying that we need to create mechanization of labor in the end of the day understanding that if you want to create a better economy within the U.S., for example, you need more efficacy and more efficiency in, you know, in creating more product, right? We said, I'm not going to try to argue about that, but I'm saying that if you create more products, I know that certain, you know, certain position or certain vacancy would eventually be replaced, right? Two response. Number one, I say that certain certain uh, you know certain places in terms of office for example cannot be replaced right for example those that need emotions those that those need that need affection but i understand that certain people but eventually be replaced it is eventually okay under the opening opposition number one people is always eventually adapting towards technology right for example before people does not know any kind of googles and now they do they do have you know they do understand those kind of things but second it is eventually within the 
the moment that we're trying to create the discussion on how we should protect the labor for the, the, the rights of the labor, it's actually the moment that you're trying to give them more education, more, more healthcare system, and etc. Right? The moment that people would eventually realize that they're gonna be replaced by the mechanization of you know the mechanization of labor in the end of the day is the moment that you're trying to push for more education and trying to push for more skill training in order for them to be adapting towards the technology. That is the kind of fights that you need, right? But the only way, the only problem right now within the status quo is that people are trying to, you know, trying to block the mechanization of mechanization of labor. That is the moment that you cannot get the those kind of funding to educate these labors in the end of the day. Yes. Oh possible. So, what is the incentive for the nation to respond to these labor unions if the easiest option is just to say that we're going to mechanize anyway? So, all of the things that you are fighting for doesn't matter to it is not eventually true as well, right? If that is good government, is the one that eventually would like to hear the the voices coming from the people, right? Furthermore, these people is the one that elect the government to begin with. The moment it is becoming a very sensitive issue, that is the moment that the society would eventually demand for leaders that understand on how uh, you, uh, you know labor should be protected, right? This is why in the UK there's labor union, but within the developing countries there's no labor union to begin with, right? Because people see that people uh, the, the, because people uh, because the government see that the society does not have those kind of bargaining power. We say under the opening opposition, the moment when the majority would eventually say that we need to start protecting the, the rights of the labor, that is the moment when you try to strengthen the labor union in order for them to speak out within, you know, in order for them to speak out and trying to fight for their rights. We say that is we say that mechanization of labor would not eventually you know happen directly, right? Everything will eventually be replaced by by machine at an etc. We say it takes certain point, it takes certain time or certain period for the, for you to change everything into 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 machines, right? Under your opening opposition, we say that we we, we do still have time to prepare to you know we, we do still have time to prepare for those kind of mechanization in order in order for for we for us to be adapted to that with those kind of education. That's why. The, this kind of voices coming from labor union is the right moment for you to create funding in order for the for you to push the government to change something. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so Side opposition may start on what how mechanization really looks like. Looking at that in the past, when we replace, for example, where we have cars and where things innovate, those things do not replace. Those things replace the things that humans operate on. For example, you replace horses with cars. Mechanization with the investment of AI has allowed us to replace human beings being the individuals who operate the machines or who operate whatever work that it has. This means that there are going to be a lesser number of jobs in status quo. Side the government can opposition cannot chip out on that. But number two, note here that the rate of mechanization is happening is substantially fast. Note here that it was predicted by researchers probably in 20 or 30 more years that probably only them would have, for example, AIs that are smart enough to replace intellects. But note here that we already have a status quo. AIs that can replace lawyers in terms of uh, in terms of representing individuals for summons, though it may not be significant, it's a huge step towards how they are able to understand arguments, and how they're able to mechanize the intellect that they have and replace in lawyers in that sense. What does this mean here? This means that state is quo, there's a substantially fast rate at weaponization, and we are as government as Western liberal democracies have a duty to ensure that individuals on the ground do not have or is not harmed by the mechanization of itself. One uh, one, inter one rebuttal that's not integrated inside my issues and arguments, right? Side opposition is going to argue that you're going to have time, you're going to have time to educate, and you're able to replace those jobs in when you actually have the time to educate. So, number one, we already have, I have established the fact that individuals are not going to be able to get the jobs because in terms of mechanization, the concept is to always allow machines to take over and humans to be replacing. This means that, number two, even if you want to argue there's going to be some education that the loss of jobs is not going to be substantially fast rate, the outstanding goal that exists under side opposition is that they do want to replace humans in the future. And this means that side opposition has to prove that regardless of the time frame, there needs to be, even if it's now, side opposition has to defend mechanization. 
And why is it that it's unlikely that mechanized education is going to happen? You will hear that number one. My first speaker told you that when you have mechanized and first, first issue and also a vertical extension of the argument. Number one, when you have mechanization, it means that the accumulation of wealth is going to go to the individuals who are in charge of corporations more. Why is this so? The reasons why CEOs of McDonald's, not CEOs, but a lot of franchise owners in the United States opposes the raising of a minimum wage for McDonald's workers to $40, $40 per hour in New York City is because of the fact that individuals are saying it's too much for the company to win them and what they do really place the workers the machines are able to automate the work of questions or automate the work of people who can actually you know construct mcdonald petty whatever what does this mean here number one business oftentimes automate the reasons as to save costs in this instance right when business save costs it means that the accumulation of wealth would oftentimes go to the bosses first that's the reason why there's such a huge opposition by the government or by the people itself to actually say that you actually want to increase the minimum wage how is it going to look like when you actually mechanize it even more? Number two, individuals like the boss of Amazon or Bill Gates are going to be able to profit the company's taxes and will be able to profit from the fact that there are lesser labors in status quo and they're being able to actually save costs by having lesser labors. What does this look like then in terms of full mechanization under their world? Number one, those individuals are going to be the individuals who are the most wealth in status quo and able to negotiate the government the rate of UBI that you're going to provide or the rate of taxation that's going to work. Why is this so? Obviously, when your government have to negotiate directly for company for providing their money oftentimes no one have to take the trial just look at Ireland the fact that in 2012 they actually allow Apple to get away with 40 billion amount of taxes is because Apple is the sole provider or the most contributor towards Ireland's taxation system in this instance it's clear that when governments have an incentive or government depend on certain companies to get the taxation money to provide to the people they will oftentimes allow those corporations to get away with a lot of this best case scenario right? Western liberal democracy US such a huge lack of push from the government to actually control the practices of Apple in China, which they do not account for the labor or the labor quality of life, for example, the, pro the pollution of companies whatsoever. This means that corporations oftentimes control the government, be it through the lobbying of politicians or be it through the lobbying of the government itself. Number two, right? When you have a macroeconomic when you have a mechanization, this is in principle why, in principle why the Western liberal units, even if you had the best case of UBI, it's not going to work. Number one, not here is UBI oftentimes account for an amount that's not substantially enough for you to be able to experience luxurious things in life. Not here why luxury is important. No, we're not talking about luxury, about being able to own a jet ski or boat land or whatsoever. Luxury is subjective to individuals on the ground. When you look at this, it means that oftentimes you look at models such as Norway, in which they put a high income tax on the individuals on the ground to provide them the basic necessities, but they disallow individuals on the ground to be able to buy the luxurious things that they want in life. Don't hear that in Norway, a lot of things are luxurious because basic necessities are already provided. Why? How does this look like then? Number two, when you have a government that solely focuses on providing individuals on the ground basic necessities, governments and Western democracies are not actually providing, actually doing their job as a Western democracy. Why is this so? Western democracy is about the, the, the maximization of choice of individuals being able to operate or take the choices that they want in their life. This is important because the choices that you can take in your life are oftentimes how you live your life. And the human experience that you have in your life is dependent upon the choices that you can take. How is not UBI limits the amount, right? But now let's live in the best case scenario. Let's take the jobs in of itself, right? The jobs oftentimes represent how individuals live their life. And oftentimes you already expire from the start or from birth how kind of job is that you want to do in the future. So number one, when you have a mechanization and replacements of individuals to be able to take up jobs, it means that there's a lesser amount of choices of jobs that individuals can choose for. This means that individuals are unable to live the life things that they have from the start and they are unable to actually live the take up the choices that they have from one choice. So you see not answering the question. Assuming we do take the hard pulls in the jobs, why is it problematic when the ability for them to sustain themselves, live their lives as they want, find self-actualization back? Number one, I told you it's unlikely for government to be able to provide a sufficient amount of UBI because a lot of the times they're able to be lobbying the corporations because when they're sole provider of economy towards those companies. But I'm telling you, even the best case scenario in principle, Western democracies need to maximize the choices that individuals have. This means that even if you're taking away or replacing the jobs, that's a lesser amount of choices that individuals can take when it comes to being able to live their life and how they want to. But number two, right? 
Why is it that you also lessen the amount of choices when you have UBI? Note here, the OPC corporations, when want to mechanize, they have an incentive to maximize their own life choices. This means that a lot of individuals or CEOs in the company in the future when you fully mechanize are going to be the individuals who are able to control what kind of UBI, what kind of life that they decide individuals on the ground will live as. This means, right, number one, if they decide that individuals on the ground are not able to get the sufficient amount of UBI that affects their ability to buy luxurious things such as their own Rolex or their own islands means that the companies or CEOs are the ones who are able to maximize their choice loss. Not here that individuals are most affected are people who are middle income or low. These individuals have no power to lobby the government, especially when the labor amount is sufficiently less and they require the amount to actually pressure the government. To conclude, right? As best case scenario coming from side opposition, they still have to take the trade off of how people have less choices. And as a Western liberal democracy, you're not doing your job then. that happened right now in the current status quo is that mechanization already happened. The question in this debate is that should we continue that process or should we stop the entire process of mechanization? Under opening oppositions, we argue to you that if you stop the mechanization process, I think that that is not only bad for the economy of US as a whole, because exactly this debate talked about the economy, but I think it is also bad for the laborers that also they want to protect under their salary house right. What opening opposition want in this debate is that we're going to argue that number one, mechanization of labor is necessary in country like US. Because why? Because these countries have a certain characteristic that opening government entirely dismiss, right? Country like US exactly have a characteristic where they have a high demand coming from their people, right? High consuming activity that is exactly the productive the activity that most people have, right? Therefore, mechanization is way to actually fulfill that demand coming from their people. So I don't see problems with that. But second, I think that it is impossible for a country like US to against the existence of technology because exactly that narrative going to come under their side of the house the moment when they oppose the mechanization, right? Because mechanization is something that we cannot deny and reject right now. So thank you. Now, however, we also review that under opening opposition, it is impossible for mechanization to replace the entire job field, right? Because that's exactly the assumption coming from opening governments. Most likely, mechanization have a vision to aim efficiency. Therefore, there is a typical certain of job that still exists in the current status quo. For example, the emotion that requires the human emotion and stuff, and things like that still also exist under a certain house. So we don't believe that it's going to replace the entire job field entirely, right? So what is the thing that I'm going to talk about in my speech? I'm going to talk about number, uh, number one, what happens if you oppose the mechanism Decision. Why it is bad for economy of US as a whole? Because this is exactly what we want to protect under a certain house, right? And home mechanization is the way for US to get their success to be a global power, right? But before let's deal with the arguments coming from the government side of the house, because they want to talk about labor and lesser job opportunity and stuff like that, right? But first of all, the problem under opening government is that they argue that there is underpaid workers and therefore it's creating less of leverage, right? I think that under the the house, my first speaker already told you, exactly with the rising of mechanization, it creates threat to individual that now you have push and you know externality that you need to be more uh, creative, that you need to have more skills, for example, so that you have that with the rising of mechanization, right? I think that the best case scenario that happened under our set of the house is that maybe you want to force yourself to have Creativity, like for example, creating creating economy, uh, you know, creative economy and stuff like that. You create something that is based on your own, that you have the capability to do so. Therefore, you don't depend on the uh, on this mechanization any longer, right? So therefore, I think that with uh, with the rising mechanization, with supporting mechanization, you have the ability to force yourself to have this uh, creative uh, creativity to actually depend, uh, you know, to create independence on yourself. But second response. They, talk, they set up the house talking about the lesser job opportunity and stuff like that, right? Or how to profit only deliver to the higher positions only. Now, I don't think that it is true, right? Because in a company, there's also regulations in that particular company. Like, for example, they have to make sure that there's professional uh, 
welfare and proportionate, uh, you know, uh, salary, for example, and that that kind of things also exist within a company. But second of all, within the, this idea, only based on the assumption that company are that evil, right? Let me tell you what is happening right now in the status quo. In the status quo right now, there is actually a trend for a company to be progressive and to be more care to their workers. This is happening in which that, for example, a lot of social movement are actually against a certain company when a company create bad thing to the workers, right? Create exploitation to the workers. This is exactly the type of status quo that is happening right now. There is a demand coming from people that if you are becoming a bad company, then you are not going to be consumed anymore by the people. Therefore, we think that this characteristic is something that you can uh, simply reject because it is exactly uh, the progressivity in the current status quo. Like, for example, uh, after this. Like for example, there's an active social movement for workers' protection that right now already been rising, right? A lot of voices now being heard, and therefore we think that the status quo is not as uh, you know as uh, as tragic as what teams governments want to review. Sure. Your argument is that a lot of these NGOs or labor unions who fight for rights of people, how does that happen in a world where these people lose their jobs? There will be no one to fight for. We think that, look, uh, even if people lose job, I think that it is still okay because it is a trip to them to be more creative, right? Because that is the only thing that, uh, you know, we want to argue under opening oppositions. Without, you know, with supporting mechanization, it creates something that forced themselves to be out of the box and therefore did not uh, rely on the company that exactly will exploit them at first, right? So what I'm going to talk about in my speech then, I'm going to talk about what happened if you oppose the mechanization, which we think that it's the worst scenario that happens under government side. It is going to worsen the economy of the state or country like you asked, it's exactly the actor that we talk about in this debate, right? I think that clearly this debate talk about economy. U.S., a country like U.S., for example, is a global empire, empire that have economic power and the most uh, dominant country in terms of economy in the world. Let's characterize these one by one, right? I think that U.S. have, uh, no, thank you, huge real, uh, real, uh, you know, bilateral agreements with foreigners, like, for example, making deal with other regimes, like, for example, with Asia, uh, Europe, Australia, and to the, to the whole world, right? I think that they also have a long-lasting economic cooperation, like exporting products to the global world. Like for example, manufacturing industry that right now become one of the biggest entities in US, right? Let me tell you why US succeeds in this industry. Exactly because of mechanization. Therefore, we think that what we want to argue under opening opposition is that how then we can uphold the economic powers within the country that we talk about in this debate, which is the Western liberal democracy, right? I think the mechanism is very necessary and important for this country to keep in, right? Because why? Because the mechanism, mechanization have their own effectivity. Like, for example, they are able to have uh, to creating mass productions. They, they create a high quality product. And it is important for this country because they can maintain their economy in Cambridge. Right? Now, why then it is important? Because under your side of the house, I think that you lessen the capability of this country to create a manufacturing industry that is good, and therefore it also harms the people because they don't have the ability to consume that anymore. Because you harm the company and you harm the people who becoming the lawyer, uh, the lawyer consumers of that product, and I think that is bad for both sides. And I think for, for all of those reasons, we close the debate for company. <laughs> I think it's fine to say that you should be creative when it comes to creating job opportunities for yourself. But we need to understand the reality that we fit in. More often than not, that in Western liberal democracies are often hubs and arrival destinations for refugees and immigrants. And these people often become the laborers of the low-skilled uh, low sectors that we are talking about in this debate. This means to say that these immigrants don't have a lot of choices when it comes to having sources of financial income and financial independence, which means to say that these people can't really become creative when it comes to finding job opportunities when they lose their jobs as a result of mechanization. 
more importantly, these are the people that often lose out because systems of state, systems of welfare that states implement often do not protect immigrants. It often means that people like within society who become nationalistic don't want to help these people, which means that at the end of the day, these minorities and these immigrants are the people that are going to lose out and are going to be the worst people affected in this debate. And that's what CG is going to prove conclusively and exclusively. Before that, let's go into a couple of rebuttals of framing the debate, right? So let's firstly look at the, the mechanization of labor and the financial independence of the poorest people in society. I think the framing which we approach the debate isn't so much employers using mechanization as a threat to fight like over workers to make them work harder or something like that, but rather it is the analysis of the trend that mechanization is already happening, people are already losing their jobs. What do we do about it and what is the impact of that? Yeah, so the alternative for workers with this task was that sure, opening opposition can say that they counter propose something like a UBI. I think the DPM does sufficient work in deconstructing why a UBI is not the best option to go, and there really wasn't much response coming from that. But I think over and above that, they needed to provide some sort of reasoning of why a UBI would realistically happen in today's world. Because if you understand the reality of how governments and how people function, the perception of a UBI is what is giving free money towards poor people. So people who actually do work and people who actually pay taxes don't like the concept of UBI because they see it as a, they see the giving of free money towards poor people out there that they don't want. Meaning to say, there's, lack, there's really a, a like not a lot of political will to support the UBI and there wasn't any analysis of like why things would happen under that side of the house. More importantly, it also requires high taxation rates, which is why countries such as Norway can do it because they are welfare states and they are rich to uh, have the capability to write the state. If you're talking about countries like the US with like how many million immigrants they have, it's a bit difficult to physically implement a UBI. What's far more likely to happen, I'll give you a chance after this, uh, what's far more likely to happen is that these immigrants or these poorer people who get thrown into the welfare system, right? They'll be living off welfare benefits, they'll be living off food stamps. It's a broken system where people fall through the cracks. It's a system where poverty abounds, where racism and structural oppression continue to exist, where crime and drugs and prostitution continue to happen. These are the situations that they condemn those people because they weren't created enough. But more importantly, even if they can't do it and still try to push for this sort of thing, arguing uh, the, the UBI isn't amazing because if, they, if the state, like, if they argue by fiat, the state can pump money into UBI, then they, the, the country is more likely to go bankrupt. Like, it's a case for Greece 101. I think this, even if, even if they're by fiat, this, this argument or this model is uh, not very realistic to happen. So, uh, a couple of responses before I go into I'll take out of my responses, okay? They say, uh, they say under that side of the house that under the process of mechanization, when uh, less people are employed, labor unions have more power. Why? Because uh, then, because then labor labor unions have more members and are able to lobby the governments to change things. There's no explanation as to how this happened or why this even happened to start with. I think in response, right, the best case scenario under that side of the house is states being benevolent and listening to labor unions. If you understand the political incentives or how how efficient mechanization can be for countries and for the economic benefit from it, it's less likely the states would want to listen to these labor unions. But more importantly, if you take an antagonistic approach of demanding that your benevolent states do things for you, I think it's less likely for things to happen. I think it's more likely that because there are more workers who don't have jobs and less jobs available for these workers who don't have the skills to do this job, it's more likely that these labor unions lose power. It's more likely these states don't want to listen to these labor unions because they see them as a source of noise. They see them as a source of liability of people that they need to pay. So I don't think labor unions gain more power. Even if it does, it would be good for the people. But the second thing they say is that the DLO says that, oh, but the needs of the people will be fulfilled by via the process of mechanization without explaining how this happened. But even if this were true, I think that the demand for the services provided by this often comes from people who are comfortable, right? It is not the poorest people's society. The people who have the capability and the financial ability to buy things are people who have some degree of money as not the people that we're talking about in this debate. The next thing they say is that there'll be a discussion of mechanism of how people can push for education. I think the first response to say this already is that's poor and there's a lot of problems. With it. But number two, there's no analysis or no explanation of why the process of mechanization improves the discussion or moves this forward even more. Because to understand the way that states prioritize the taxation and the process of education, it's often prioritized towards their people. These immigrants and the children of immigrants are often people that lose out the most because those people don't have the support of the state. Those people don't have the support of the majority of society. So I think the discussion, even if it happens, does not benefit the most vulnerable people in this debate. Before I go on, yes. So Moji told us that jobs like factory jobs and low skill jobs are already being recognized, therefore not part of pay. Therefore, in your high school jobs that you said that you're supposed to spend, how can these people get any jobs in the first place? Uh, 
I think that the reality is that there's options to mechanize, but the process in which we're going about it means to say that some jobs are not mechanized. I mean, the reality is that in the US, a lot of like immigrants from Mexico and Latin America are working in those jobs in those factories, even though options of mechanization are available. And I think this debate needs to occur in that reality. So, extension. Why the loss of employment destabilizes society and creates political repercussions for the most vulnerable people in society? Understand that Western liberal democracies such as the EU and the US often citizens are, are prioritized when it comes to giving them education and uh, job opportunities, right? Except in the US, right? Because like there's racism and structural oppression. Meaning to say that most new work is often done by immigrants, and I said this earlier. Sure, poorer citizens may be caught by the welfare system, however broken it may be, but the immigrants and the minorities within society often do not get, receive employment benefits, often their wages are extremely low, and if they lose their employment, they're more, far more likely to not even get those welfare benefits that the state gives out to everyone. What is the harm of this? Three things. Number one, immigrants losing their job means that they become desperate because welfare systems often do not protect them, means that they're often exploited by crime syndicates. They might become forced to become drug news, forced into prostitution in order to support themselves and to support their families. Secondly, we think that this, this empowers things such as terrorist recruitment in places like the EU where they say the society hates you, uh, the government hates you, if you want an option, come and join us. Things like terrorist groups like ISIS, like maybe not ISIS anymore, anymore, but other Islamic fundamentalists and radicalists are more likely to do these sorts of things, to recruit terrorists and to provide them a source of recruitment. Lastly, Right wing, right wing rhetoric are far more likely to increase because people in currently in the status quo, people increasingly nationalist, increasingly right wing, are more likely to hate on these people even more, to see them as features of society, to not want to help them any longer, and we think that this hurts them in the worst ways possible. We think that mechanization can have benefits for the economy, but if it comes at the cost of society, we would oppose it. Thank you, member of the government. Maybe five minutes for you. In the early 1900s, and with that, in the early 2000s, society panicked the idea of automobiles. In the early 2000s, society panicked the idea of a changing demographic of industries, changing from your concrete shops to internet industries and new businesses. People thought that horses would have no use in the 1900s. They thought that your small, local, pestle and bottle shops would have no ideas. But would and society just collapse. But it didn't. The speed, efficiency, and safety of cars, the speed, efficiency, and safety of new industries increase human mobility. More people are able to enter cities and search for jobs. More people are able to uh, have better education and better ability. Poverty was reduced and a burgeoning middle class was born. New jobs and industries was created. Panel, we tell you that industries rise and die, jobs are created and lost. But societal progress remains a constant. Society moves on. On CEO, we'll bring you two argumentations. Firstly, we'll tell you that the mechanization of labor is an inherent part of human progress that ensures the ability and the maximization of choice for each every for every single individual. And secondly, we tell you that it creates an incentive for the people to be politically active and fight for their political rights. We think opening opposition has did a good job of setting up the debate, but was unclear into exactly how that analysis and how that conclusion will be reached. While we think opening government has told you a very good idea of just exactly how horrible companies are, but don't tell us how that doesn't change on their side of the house, nor did CG argue to you how any argument that they had will ever change, nor did they tell you the, co the comparative that exists. Before I move to my argumentations, a few points or responses. Firstly, to CG, because CG told you that these people, that refugees won't get a job. No, firstly, why do we care about refugees more than the needs of society in the first place? They don't tell that down. Therefore, all the argumentation has very little value the moment they don't prove why exactly the needs of certain refugees are more important than everyone else. Second, I'll tell you, Train them lah. You can create new industries, you can create new jobs, we can ensure that everyone get better better education. Any refugees that come to any Western countries will need that training anyway. They need adaptation to local cultures, local skills, local languages. And this is just one part of that ability for them to move on, to move out. And even then, my POI was answered because they told us, oh no, Hispanics from Mexico are able to get jobs in factories. Therefore, they admit that these people can get some jobs in mechanized industries. Yeah, you have less jobs, but the jobs of people maintaining these machines, 
the jobs of people running and ensuring that these machines don't get destroyed will still exist. The abilities for people to create new jobs and work in industries that don't require automation or automation doesn't fit will still be there. What kind of industries are we talking about? We're talking about really highly specialized niche of physical industries. Your people are plumbers and electricians who work in very specific problems of whom mechanized labor cut exactly replace your specific lawyers and doctors and nurses or people who work based on interpersonal communication then all your communication like this will still need that very specific human communication yes you can have your machines to uh, file everything down but these people can't talk to your clients these people can't talk to the people these are the exact jobs that will still exist and it's important because in western liberal democracies these are the jobs that already exist anyway these are highly service based nations that require that base themselves on human communication and services we think these people and these hubs can still be mitigated most of the hubs coming inside government, coming inside government will really be problematic so while i'm going over to my communications which all deal directly with application coming from og cg Okay, so uh, you can argue that there is work to maintain the machine, but the machine does the work of 10 other people. We need to say that people still lose jobs under no time of the house. So how do you ensure that those people who lose jobs can get the skills and can get the training that you promised them in order to become more sustainable? Well, tax is cooperation more will ensure that you can have some form of a fight. But even then, we tell you that the creation of new industries in the 90s and 2000s meant that you could create new jobs such as, I know, different types, different types of IT, for example. These people and new industries will always exist, and what needs is society moves on and moves forward while ensuring that the lower quality of jobs or the lower level of jobs, lower tier of jobs, will be there for your entities to work on. So, first argumentation we tell you the mechanization of labor is an inherent part of human progress. So we tell you panel that the ability for people to move forward and have that value of efficiency is the most important part. That society will always move on. And when you lose the ability for people to make jobs, we tell you in the best case scenario, this means you create new incentives for corporations to offer new jobs for corporations to discover that hey. We resolve that problem, but we create new problems instead. That's what happens the moment any industry dies and any industry needs to move forward. The ability of new blue ocean industries, blue sky industries, and new jobs means that new corporations will always need newer jobs and therefore more people to, to tap into those jobs. But even then, we tell you that this uh, automation more often than not increases the quality of life. The ability for you to have safer, safer transportation because of automated transport. The ability for you to have a better quality of life because oh. your transportation, which is now more efficient, means you are able to have a better quality of life and less time on the traffic and less time on stress. This ability means that these people have a better ability for them to move free from their jobs in the first place. To have more free time and more free ability for them to function on their own, to find what their interests are, to self actualize. This is especially important in nations where you do have an aging population. In nations like Japan, which in of itself is already mostly the Western liberal nation, anyway, your Swedens, your Canadas, your friends and others who always have their, their interests to ensure that they can benefit these uh, specific aging populations. But even then, we tell you, I know, that the ability for us to benefit these people is important because your choice is important almost as a house. But we tell you that your choice is, limit, is limited on site government because you must work in the first place. Your job and your life is dependent on that work. We tell you that the moment we remove that, we, we give the ability for people to actually live the life as they want. Government is the one that's actually limiting the choice of the people. Second argumentation, here's where we prove to you how exactly we're able to fight for these uh, UBIs, for example. No. Because we tell you, panel, that the moment we lose their jobs, and the more people, the more people are angry and saddened, and the more harms that exist on that, that is our tools to ensure that these people can fight. That is when politicians can enter and fight for the needs of the people. Your people like uh, Alexander Hazel Cortez, your people like Bernie Sanders, your people like Jeremy Corbyn, for God's sake, can just enter and tell and empower these people to fight for their rights. We tell you this more likely than the argumentation of labor units that exist. This means the ability for these politicians to pander to the majority of the population because if they are to, to be relieved, all the harms affect the majority of the population. Therefore, these politicians can fight for the people. And this is important because what you do need in this school is the ability for people to move away from apathy towards politics because people think that politicians don't care. What this creates is a more incentive for politicians to pander towards them, for the people to have an interest in politics because they realize that the anger that they have is towards your corporations, is towards your politicians who have been brought over by politicians. This means the ability for us to use politicians to lobby corporations, the ability for politicians to fight for greater taxation, to fight for progressive taxation, to fight for UBI. This has already happened in the Scandinavian countries. This is already proof of trends of progress in America with Alexander Ocasio Cortez, in Britain with Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. The ability for people to be more improved and more 
involved in politics is important as the house. And what we pursue is the ability for them to be able to access those things. The people for the ability for people to actually care about politics, the ability for people to actually fight for their own rights. Proud to oppose. I mean, I'm sorry if CEO didn't think that refugees were an important part of this debate, but when an argument is made and at least explained to some degree, you cannot just tell me, ah, my rebuttal is basically just why is refugees important? You never prove why refugees are important. Like, I think you also need to tell me why you can trade refugees off of the rest of society that the state already protects to a certain degree, given that we spend the bulk of our analysis telling you why refugees are individuals that fall through the crack and don't oftentimes get the state protection that you thought were important. Because if you notice, the way in which they rectify the harms were quite persuasive. They tell me, ah, you can fight for UBI, you can fight for all these things. But if you notice, all of these things only apply to citizens of that country. So you need to also deal with the individuals who are likely to fall through the cracks and don't get access to these things, given that these are the biggest stakeholders in this debate that are going to lose their jobs. It may not be the most persuasive argument in the world, but I expected at least some kind of response so we can have actual weighing of which kind of stakeholders matter more. You can't just assert to me that all you want to protect citizens of the country without actually wanting to deal or at least justify why it's okay to trade these people off. I think there was intellectual laziness on that side of the house. The second thing they told you, and if you listen to the analysis, I think at this point, the strongest part of Ops case, and maybe they're really at this stage because they can show you why they can fight for labor unions and labor unions get stronger. But notice that this is strategically unwise because this is reactive at best. Making lab like labor unions are created to react to social injustice. So at the point where there is no injustice, there is literally no value to having a stronger labor union. Because the comparative is that people get jobs and people get access to their basic rights. In which case, we don't need a strong labor union because there is no injustice done in the first place. So all of Arsene's example and OO about having stronger labor unions are a reaction to social injustice. We would rather that social injustice not be committed in the first place. Because if you look at the language of his argumentation, it literally was that we can have stronger labor unions in order to help these people to give UBI. Like, if these people have jobs in the first place, maybe you didn't need all of those reactions to take place. But what was problematic with that speech is we already had a pre bubble to this. We explained systemically why UBI was not something that was a good thing. And they didn't respond to this. Because things like UBI and welfare programs are things that are illegitimate. Why is that the case? Reverend told you, and no response from any of the speakers on that side, was that oftentimes this is oftentimes hijacked by political ideologies. And it's hijacked by politicians who say, for example, that these people are just there to steal and take free money, but they're not doing anything. That's why you get things that, that's why you get the stigma that these people are leeches and these people don't contribute to society. So even if we assume they're in UBI, the fuck out of these countries, it is unlikely that these governments are the ones that's going to be voted in. Because Asim just cropped this debate out by saying, you got Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn to, to protect them. There's a reason why these two people aren't voted in. These two people aren't voted in precisely because the demographics of people they care about were individuals and were prol proletariats and immigrants who don't have bargaining power in the first place. Because that power that they talked about to bargain and demand for your rights matters insofar as you have a voting outlet and you have a stake or you can participate in that democratic process. So for all of these people who don't have the ability to demand things from the government, you lose all of that benefits on your side. That's why all of the people that you claim are the best things for fighting for this progress like Jeremy Corbyn or Bernie Sanders don't get voted in. So the world we live in is people like Trump or UKIP in UK and US getting into power. This, this feeds on the kind of rhetoric that people can use because they claim a unique sense of nationalism to say we are going to protect the country from things like communism or we want to protect the country from immigrants because immigrants are leeches in society. That's why even though ideally we would want the governments to benevolent and protect these people, it is unlikely because in real life the trend that we are seeing isn't people like Bernie Sanders getting it? If it were, maybe they would operate on a different debate. But we have to deal with the reality and the context that we exist in today, where these people are not getting voted in. Where what you do get are people like Donald Trump being able to use that kind of anger directed at the right-wing individuals to push them away by saying that these immigrants don't belong here. That's why it was problematic that they didn't want to respond to this analysis. But why was it important, the extension that um, Raven talked to you in his speech? Because you made the political impacts a lot more egregious. 
egregious, right? And why is this the case? There are two reasons why this is the case. The first thing we're thinking about, the first thing we'll point out is that you allow for things that are fundamentalist in nature. So populist political revolts stem from the idea that individuals that are having a lot in, like, in these industrialized democracies are unable to fight for rights of the minority and the working class individual. Because the comparative they drew was that the standard of living of everybody gets better. But that's just categorically false. Because if you listen to the language of his analysis, it is things like lawyers, things like marketing directors that are unable to replace. These are the kind of individuals that are not the kind of like vulnerable groups of people that actually need help in this debate. So we would suggest, and I'll justify this principle even more. Hold on a second, I'll take from closing. Um, like, We'll justify this even more to tell you that like these are the people who are already comfortable and we are okay with sacrificing additional comfort for people who already own high paying jobs like lawyers or like marketing directors if it means that your basic groups of individuals like people who are like like refugees or the poor people get access to a median wage for example this is something we think is more important because these are basic rights that should be guaranteed as opposed to additional comfort for people at the top before six hours ago. So let's just say you are the rich are becoming richer, the poor are becoming poor. Why then would the poor vote against their own interests and vote for the needs of the rich? No, there are two parts of this argument. You are completing the arguments together. The first part of this argument is that there are poor individuals who have less bargaining power in the same way in which the poor people in America don't have as much political power as large corporations and lobby groups that often time want to vote for their own interests, so they fundamentally can lobby for candidates like Donald Trump. The second part of this argumentation is that immigrants who fall through the cracks and don't have state projects to look for their welfare, don't have the capacity to be a part of the democratic process to do all of the voting that you say exists. Because if your logic is true, I say, by now you have people like Bernie Sanders who are populist in nature, who care about people and want to give welfare in power, but we don't. Assuming what Azim say is true, that doesn't cohere with the reality of the situation that the people who actually get voted in are those kind of people in this debate. So what is the unique thing that we prove to you coming from closing? Three things. The first thing we prove to you uniquely in closing is that even if we buy the best versions of Opkis, that they have some inherent interest to provide things like UBI or welfare to citizens, the first thing we questioned was whether or not the UBI will be positively reviewed. And we think it's unlikely to happen because people will just funnel the kind of right-wing rhetoric that people are here to steal our jobs and are lazy and taking free money. But the second impact of this is that we point out that you enrage or you fuel the ability for UK or Donald Trump to get into positions of power to make those decisions that entrench this kind of right-wing agenda against the most vulnerable individuals in this debate. But the third thing we also proved was even if you don't buy poor people on the spectrum, there's an important stakeholders that we need to consider about, which are immigrants who fall out of that national project. We agree, you might not think this is the most important stakeholder, but I think you need some discussion as to why we can trade these things off, and you can't just tell me these people are unimportant. That's why we are very happy to close. <laughs> Madam Chair, let us take a step back and really understand the context of today's debate, right? When we are talking about mechanization, I think it is fair to assume that mechanization is not going to be all encompassing. It means that probably the very first question that we have to ask ourselves in order for us to really understand how does all the harm that was brought by the side, by the side opening government and also uh, closing government is going to look like. They say that at the end of the day, this is going to like cause a lot of people losing their jobs and things like that. But the very first question that we have to ask ourselves is that where does the mechanization centralize at? That is exactly the reason why we think that the characterization that was brought by the side closing opposition is extremely important. But we tell you that at best, mechanization is something that is oftentimes being able to be done by huge corporations or probably like factories and things like that. What does, what does this mean? This means that grocery stores are not going to have robots who are going to replace the cashiers. This means that waiters are not going to be replaced by, you know, like um, by by automatic, um, you know, like by, by automatic machines and things like that, by computers, because at the end of the day, that requires your ability to even opt into these technologies to begin with. So that the very first argument that was brought by the closing government talking about why this refugee do matter, we believe that actually they do matter. 
Okay, but the very first thing, and uh, but the very first thing, oftentimes we think that the worst thing that is going to happen in our side is that, like, maybe they are not going to be able to work in factories because, like, they are, you know, like probably the production was actually taken uh, care by robotic arms and things like that. But oftentimes they would go into worlds that are oftentimes being opted uh, 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 that are going to be like um, operated by a real human being, like for example, chefs or probably like cashiers and also like um, waiters at the stores and things like that. Those are the kind of jobs that are not going to be like replaced by mechanization, even though you can, because at the end of the day, just because you can like replace these things by mechanization, it doesn't mean that they're going to be taken at the end of the day. But secondly, the most importantly, I think like it is fair to assume that we are not dismissing the importance of refugees altogether, right? But the very first question is that, why does the interest of these refugees are going to be more, matter more for the people at the end of the day when, it, when, when we tell you that um, when, when we tell you that it is the interest of the people that you are going that the government are oftentimes fight for at the end of the day. But we think that more importantly, we think like the idea of the entrenchment or prejudice it down or probably racism and things like that, those are the kind of things that are not mutually exclusive. It is still going to happen in our side at the end of the day. You are not going to be able to make things better to them because even with or without mechanization, these problems are still going to happen at the end of the day. Two issues in today's video, right? First, about job security, and secondly, about choice. But before that, uh, just a clarification. I think this whole case is about how mechanization is about the human development. Why is that good? If you're saying that companies won't have the incentive to make uh, jobs or machines that replace cashiers whatsoever, what profit would they make if they mechanize? Why would they even mechanize in the first place? What development would you get then? Look, like, I already like considered that probably, like, the, um, um, corporations that are going to like opt into mechanization are big corporations, but at the end of the day, grocery stores are not going to opt into all this kind of stuff. So these are the kind of jobs that people in the lower income or probably like the middle income are going to get at the end of the day. So that you're not even going to get a robot who is going to work for McDonald's, for example. First question, right? Um, about the idea of job security. That was actually answered just now when I told you that. But secondly, and the most importantly, we think like when we are talking about the idea of choice, right? I think like it is very important for us to assume that the ability for the people to lobby the politicians at the end of the day or probably the strength of your labor union is contingent upon the critical mass that you're going to get at the end of the day. The moment in which you take like, like for example, like let's assume the worst that is going to happen when you take all this like uh, ability for the people to have jobs and things like that. That is the moment when you're going to be able to strong arm the like the, the, the richer people because this means that like I like Azim already asked in the POI just now, the moment in which you have more people who are going to lose job and like um, this is the moment in which you create critical mass which is going to make your political lobbying and also like political strong army going to be more powerful at the end of the day. And more importantly, we think that they are not going to lobby for the for the corporations, right? At, the, at, at that particular moment, they are going to go and lobby to the politicians. And at the end of the day, the moment in which the politician believes that in order for them to stay in power is for them to listen to the people, that is the moment when they are going to listen to these people because they were actually fighting for their rights to actually get jobs at the end of the day. Probably the, that moment, uh, probably like that, that is the moment in which like you see like the trends that is happening in the United States of America or probably in the UK. Even though like we don't have like even though oftentimes even though in the status quo the um, conservatives are the ones who are actually in power, but there is a trend of winning, or the trend of like the left wing winning because they are more populistic by nature and because these are the kind of things that are in the best uh, interest of the people to begin with. But before that closing, so I agree. There might be a case where labor unions are stronger on your side. But you need to deal with the comparative. Labor unions are only reactive to this social justice. Comparatively, if less people lose jobs, then what is the value of your labor unions being stronger? Without people just didn't lose their jobs. Yeah, because like the moment in which that like, you are going to lose, I mean, like labor union has always been reactive. I do not see why is it a uh harm -huh, because the reactivity of that labor union is the reason why you are why these labor unions are effective at the end of the day. But let's look at the very first part of the uh, argument that was brought by us. Right, we have already told you that the mechanization of labor is an inherent part of human progress because this means, like I've stated earlier just now, the reason why I recontextualize this debate to begin with is the moment in which you allow mechanization to happen. Mechanization is often going to happen in comparison of probably like big, uh, big uh, factories to begin with. This means that w when you have a greater production, this means that the quality of life of the people are going to be better. But also more importantly, right, the moment in which you allow the production of a lot of, uh, allow, allow the increase of production, this means 
that you are going to like get like more grocery shops and this means that even at the, at the lower tier jobs are going to be created even further. But secondly and the most importantly, right, when we're talking about the idea of job security, one thing that we have to understand there is always a check and balance, right, because the ability for the corporations to mechanize everything is contingent upon the people allowing that mechanization to enter to begin with. That is the reason why when we look at the United States of America, the reason why mechanization cannot enter certain industries like ranching or probably farming to begin with is because no matter how much they try to mechanize, like for example, the ploughing of, of land or probably like the production of uh, you know corns and things like that, if these ranchers are not going to allow them to even enter this kind of industry to begin with, they are not going to be able to do that at the end of the day. Because we think that it is fair to assume that even though we believe that mechanization is, is something that is powerful, but there is always a check and balance and also like the power of the people that are going to be able to like put this mechanization in control. I'm proud to all those. Thank you.